comment on the relationship between cannabis and the opioid crisis that you see? Yeah. Um, it's, it's difficult just to get off of uh, drugs completely. And cannabis, I've seen, help people with anxiety. It helps, um, we, we, there's been some tests done where it shows that um, that anxiety or um, we did the cows test to see with people to see if how replacing um, opiates with cannabis would help, and it actually uh, reduces um, a lot of the, uh, the um, withdrawal symptoms for some people. And uh, some people use it um, with uh, like suboxone or methadone uh, just to deal with the trauma and the stress um, and, and and pain or long-term pain. Um, and I think that it's really been shown and been studied to be very useful in this crisis. And um, so, you know, we're working to bring back our program, uh, and I hope that you'll, you will support it uh, in a, so that people can have safe access to, uh, you know, cannabis, which certainly won't kill anyone, and uh, maybe help is very helpful in this crisis. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much to the Mayor and Councillors for taking a closer look at this important issue. Um, thanks also to the courageous speakers for standing up and sharing their stories. Um, it's great to see so many new faces here, uh, and thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Sorry if I'm speaking through this stuff, I've got a lot to cover. Um, my name is Jeremiah Vandermeer, and I'm here to speak to the, an issue that seems to be totally overlooked in the report, and that's cannabis as a substitution for opioids. Um, there's a significant body of scientific evidence and peer-reviewed studies that show that cannabis dispensaries save lives. Other speakers are going to get into the details and give you some resources there. Uh, there are many. But study after study shows that counties that have functioning cannabis dispensaries show a significant decrease in opioid deaths. These counties also show a decrease in fatal drunk driving crashes, as reported by Forbes magazine and other mainstream media, um, because people use cannabis instead of alcohol. Counties also show an increase in overall crime and a reduction in street dealers. Medical marijuana patients who have proved their constitutional right to access cannabis in the Canadian courts um, have been in dire need of places to get medicine across Canada. Many patients use cannabis as a substitution for addictive opioids and painkillers, and Vancouver medical cannabis dispensaries have played a vital role in providing quality medicine to those who aren't comfortable purchasing from street dealers. Uh, over the past 25 years, more than 100 dispensaries have opened in the city of Vancouver to help avert this growing medical health access crisis. I'm the CEO of a chain of cannabis stores in the city called Cannabis Culture. We have uh, four stores in the city, and we employ over 100 people. Our headquarters has been around for 25 years. We see thousands of medical patients every month, many of them senior citizens who thank us for being their only available source of medicine. They appreciate that they can look and smell their medicine before making a purchase to see if it's the type that will work for them. Different strains have different effects on different people. Chemicals in the plant called terpenes dictate these effects and they can be identified through smell and taste. It's called the entourage effect. CNN's got some great videos about it. Um, that's why strain selection is so important to patients. Cannabis Culture also donates product every month to activist groups like the Cannabis Substitution Project and Sarah and her, the project she's working on. Um, we provide free cannabis edibles to people in East Vancouver as a way to help reduce dependency on deadly opioids. The City of Vancouver in the past has recognized this need and set up a municipal program to license these cannabis dispensaries that open to serve this vitally, even when they were against federal law. Former councillors saw the important work we were doing and while we faced the threat of arrest and designed a system that was supposed to allow them to continue. Right now, unfortunately, the patients we serve are terrified. Some of them come in crime. They're extremely scared that soon they will lose their only source of access to medicine that works for them. That's because the city of Vancouver is threatening to close all the medical marijuana dispensaries down immediately. Uh, the city's telling our lawyers that they will arrest us, fine us, and shutter the buildings if we don't comply right away. We've been told by the mayor that we should just get with the program and legalize and apply for a new license. We've heard this through the media, who is really starting to pay attention to this issue. Here's me on the cover of the Star Metro from a couple days ago, talking about it. Um, well, I wanted to tell you directly, Mr. Mayor, with all due respect, we have been trying. We have applied, and we're continuing to apply at all of our stores. Uh, unfortunately, all of our locations, according to the new city bylaws, are disqualified due to harsh proximity rules because we are within 300 meters of a school, a community center, or another dispensary. Um, the vast majority of Vancouver's current dispensaries have the same problem. 
and they are disqualified from getting a new license completely. That will not change unless the bylaws change. So we're being told to get a license that we simply cannot get. And the mayor's answer to the media is that dispensaries who are struggling with licensing should just close down. Well, that answer is tough to swallow. For our, the thousands of patients and customers that we serve and the hundreds of staff people that we employ at $15 to $20 an hour, it's going to be a tough Christmas for them. There are no legal stores in Vancouver yet, though we've been promised some soon. The problem with the licensed stores, after they make it through the difficult licensing process, is staying open and paying rent while you're not actually open for business. That gets very expensive. At the same time, the media has reported that licensed stores will have virtually no supply because of massive shortages across the country due to over-restricted federal and provincial regulations. These shortages could last for years. Anyone who has purchased a legal product also knows it isn't very good. Bad medicine is not effective for patients. As well, the new rules currently ban cannabis edibles, extracts, and topicals, which many patients use instead of smoking. Unfortunately, mail-order cannabis doesn't work for those who use cannabis as a substitute for opioids who don't have an address and don't have a credit card. That's a lot of people out there. The new rules also specifically ban giving away cannabis for free, which is a major problem. It all, they also ban stores from large... What? Okay, okay, sorry. They also ban cannabis stores from large portions of the downtown east side. They also ban consumption spaces, which we need drastically. So the harms caused by closing these stores is immediate. Loss of access for thousands, loss of hundreds of jobs, and a loss of a safe alternative to medicine to opioids and other addictive drugs. Thanks very much. That's your five minutes. Okay. Would somebody have, have, a, uh, have a couple, just two more paragraphs, if anybody will. And we are talking about a report here today. Yes. Uh, you seem to have drifted outside of that purview. No, then I'll wrap it right back around. Thank you, statement here. You have your five minutes. So I, thank you for that. And we have a question from Councillor Carr. Yes, uh, Mr. Vanderkeer. Uh, I do have some questions. Sure. Uh, so let me start by um, saying, first of all, um, do you have any sense of how many uh, customers of the of the various um, cannabis stores in Vancouver, and these are medicinal cannabis. I'm thinking of this point because we don't yep. have any other, um, that that actually are um, individuals who are replacing opioid use. You mentioned some who don't have any fixed address, who don't have any credit card. They're, it's opioid substitution. Any sense of the number? Yeah, off the top of my head, no thousands. Literally thousands. We serve many, many people all the time. And I, I'm there myself seeing these people come in. They are in, in pain, many of them. Many of them are facing uh, all kinds of different uh, medical conditions, and including using opioids. You know, people get that as a prescription from their doctor, and there's also people who are eventually addicted to those things, and they try to use cannabis to get off of those things. In terms of the actual percentages, I can't say for sure, but it's a lot of people. People talk about it all the time in our stores. We help people every single day. Okay. Um, and uh, it, it, you mentioned the report, I'm assuming you've read the report, um, and it, you say that the, because you said that the report doesn't deal with this issue. Um, so if there were to be a recommendation um, in this report that is dealing with the opioid crisis, are we on the issues you raised, opioid substitution in the form of cannabis, what would that recommendation be? Uh, <clears throat> well, I, I was going to say, I ask you guys, what are the harms of allowing the dispensaries to remain open? Are there any harms at all of allowing them to remain open? We definitely know of the harms for closing them. It could mean death for people. It could mean all kinds of horrible things, um, pain and suffering. So I've come to plead with you guys here to not destroy our community. We've all been begging you to allow us to exist. We want to get licensed. We want to help change the new system for the better. We ask that you consider changing the proximity rules and the other restrictive rules immediately to something that doesn't automatically eliminate the majority of the dispensaries. And, uh, you know, we're harm reduction workers. We really are. If you guys want to ignore that, you can, but it's true. Please help us continue to save lives. This, the power to fix this issue is in your guys' hands. Uh, regarding proximity, um, uh, can, you, can you tell me how many of the stores in Vancouver that are cannabis dispensaries um, are in not licensable? The meters close to a school or a community center or those kinds of things. How many are in that category? There are a whole heck of a lot of them. It's the majority of the dispensaries that have opened in the past you know, 25 years are too close to other things to survive. Um, when the new rules were made at the very first, the media was looking at this and they said 85% of the dispensaries were in zones that were immediately disqualified. There's the option of going to the Board of Variants, but as we, anybody who's been through the process, like us, have gone through, it's nearly impossible to get through that process. Um, so yes, the majority of them. 
And you know, a lot of people, when you guys opened it up, sent their applications in for this whole thing. Um, you guys were going to look at that, but only 19 of those actually made it through in three, more than three years, almost four years. So, you know, with the idea of going forward that this was supposed to protect the dispensaries that were there, it quite frankly doesn't do that. I mean, it doesn't protect 85% of the dispensaries that are there. They can't get these licenses. Okay, I, I, if you could send me the statistic, if you, you can work that out later on about uh, yep. how many are within proximity rules, uh, within 300 meters proximity of another store as opposed to um, the uh, public facilities like schools and community centers. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I'd be happy to provide all of you guys with okay, that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Weed. Um, yeah, for the opioid substitutes, because that's what we're kind of talking about today, yes. is it more, mostly the edibles or the smokables that it would be? I don't think it's mostly either of them. I think people use all of the substances, like any form of cannabis, to as a substitute for these dangerous drugs. Um, people smoke it just as much as they use edibles. The edibles are very effective for people who aren't comfortable smoking. Um, in the downtown east side, we see that the, the um, groups like the Cannabis Substitution Project just use mostly edibles to do that um, because it's easy, you know, it's stronger in a way. Um, it also has a similar effect to some of the other opioids. You know, cannabis is different. Uh, when you choose different strains, you really do need to be able to smell those strains, know if they're sativas, indicas. Those terpene profiles become very important because some people, when they smoke, it might have a negative effect on them. When they get the strain that they like, which you can determine by smell and taste, um, it, it helps them effectively. So having that range of options of product, I think, is one of the key important parts of this. Like I said, um, edibles, topicals, and extracts right now, which are powerful things for people, are all completely banned in the new regulations. They're looking at opening that up soon, um, but currently that doesn't help the people who are using them now. And, and really when, you know, the proximity rules and the other rules make it nearly impossible. Like we've been here for 25 years, all we want is to get a license and do what we're supposed to do. You know, we'll do whatever you guys ask of us, but, you know, destroying us completely for us is not an option. And, you know, for our patients and customers and our staff, it's really de detrimental and terrifying. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council. I am going to hand around some information that you've all received in your emails. It's six pages. And we are talking about the opioid um, situation at this time. Okay, I'm going to keep one copy to refer to, and then I'll pass it on. Um, so first of all, Mayor, thank you for saying that bold actions may be taken together with all partners to change the course of the crisis. And it is true, sir, that while the city is not mandated to deliver health services, it can promote access to a wide range of treatment options. I have provided with you here today five studies, not by a bunch of pot activists, but by the uh, researchers at Social Science Research Network, the Journal of Health Economics, the U.S. National Institute on Drug Abuse, the National Bureau of Economic Research, and the Journal of the American Medical Association. All of these studies have proven without a doubt that cannabis, not just cannabis itself, but cannabis dispensaries reduce deaths and overdoses by up to 33%, and that is a significant number. That is huge. Uh, we do need safe supply to drugs for those who want to use it. We do need consumption sites for those who need to use it. But what we need more than any of that is a safer alternative, a safer choice. And for Sarah Blythe and many of the advocates working on the downtown east side and elsewhere, even at the UBC, where there is now professorship studying cannabis and opioids, the evidence is clear that people who use addictive drugs are seeking a safer choice. I myself was addicted to cocaine and antidepressants, and I quit both with the use of cannabis. Cannabis saved my life. I came to Vancouver in 2004 and I started drinking heavily. I could have become an alcoholic, but cannabis saved my life. Cannabis is not just a safer choice for people who are already addicted and suffering, it's a safer choice for those who are predisposed or likely to result in using harmful addictive drugs. For all the young people in our city who go to bars and use alcohol every night, and for everybody using opioids and other drugs, cannabis is a safer choice. You don't have to be sick and dying and on the edge of an overdose dose to benefit from cannabis. Cannabis dispensaries, as you can see, are proving to reduce these overdoses and it's a noticeable effect immediately between areas that have them and areas that don't. And even worse, when you close dispensaries, you increase deaths. So if City Hall does absolutely nothing about dispensaries, doesn't close them, doesn't open them, doesn't do anything, we'll be okay. But if you close dispensaries, the evidence shows opioid deaths will increase. The last two pages I have for you, recommended addition. 
You already have um, section I out of the alphabetical letters. You can throw in one more little that. That council issued emergency interim business licenses and or temporary bylaw exemptions to all medical cannabis dispensaries currently providing access to proven harm reduction alternatives based on scientific evidence proving the immediate and demonstrable effectiveness of cannabis as a substitution choice for consumers of opiates and other drugs. Or you could go even further, put in a whole new letter, O, withdraw the city order to close medical dispensary access points and issue emergency permits to operate. And I include a few little you know, details there about why and how that can be done. And I will read aloud to you now just a few more final points. We can prevent the development of more addictions and overdoses from alcohol, opioids, and other drugs by providing a safer choice. The BC Center of Substance, which was speaking earlier, noted in 2018, this year in March, that daily cannabis use could delay at-risk youth from moving to higher-risk drug use. They're saying, they've studied, that young people who don't use needles and opioids, if they're given access to cannabis, they're far less likely to use those hard drugs. We could save lives before people are in a crisis situation. For the workers on the front lines who have been sacrificing their time, they're in trauma. I feel traumatized because we're constantly under threat, but they're traumatized too. Mr. Mayor, please consider that they are traumatized, and cannabis is proven for veterans and frontline workers alike to be a treatment for this trauma and this pain. Safe drug supply is key, but what consumers want is a safer choice. And donations of cannabis cost money to dispensaries. But dispensaries, as businesses, are paying taxes, hiring employees, and giving this cannabis to people. Our own employees at Cannabis Culture, many of them are at-risk youth themselves. They can't find jobs elsewhere. And if they lose their jobs, they will lose their homes, and many of them are already struggling with other drugs. We provide a safe workplace and a safe space. Plus, Peaceful civil disobedience, Mr. Mayor. You and others here recognize that important social issues require taking a stand, even when bigger powers at higher levels of government might be telling you to do otherwise. But when it means that it's an issue like this, where you can make a difference by taking a stand, where Vancouver's historical reputation as a drug policy leader could make a difference, you have a court decision now telling you you have the right to do whatever you would like to do in order to address this. So please consider my recommendations to the task force and thank you for your time. Councilor Dejo, please go ahead. Speak specifically to the task force's recommendations. You had talked about, and the previous speaker had talked about access to cannabis. So I'm wondering, with the dispensary <coughs> and the decision that's recently come down, uh, are you suggesting that, that the City of Vancouver take a different stand against what the courts have, have ruled on? Well, the City of Vancouver went to court with this. So it was the City of Vancouver versus dispensaries. Um, the City of Vancouver could say, you know what? Upon reviewing the recent news that Justin Trudeau, our own Prime Minister, admits there will not be cannabis supply for the recreational chains, and there are no medical stores. Consider that all of the current uh, supply in the legal system, it won't even be available. So access is an issue. Um, when a patient... So I have a question. You had said when to court versus or against, but I understand from, from our staff that actually they were voluntary participants to move forward with that. Well, the test case was certainly something we could opt to join in with, but if we hadn't joined in, we would have still been affected by the decision. So the concern right now is that the city of Vancouver's move to shut down dispensaries um, isn't really addressing an actual public health or safety threat. Okay, so that wasn't that. Thank you for addressing that question. I also, in looking at this and looking at the way that these, like, looking at the four pillars approach, one part of that approach is enforcement. So, I. I believe that we have to firmly look at other approaches, including harm reduction, including the Naomi trial that was very short-lived here in Vancouver, including the uh, a number of different ideas that the task force is looking at. Uh, I'm not going to go through each and every one of them that Sarah Bly spoke to. I believe we need to look at, at that. But in looking at how to keep these drugs out of our system and make sure that, I mean, for every one medical marijuana dispensary, there could be another one that is, is actually a retail store and is being supplied by an organization that's involved in other activities. Is that correct? Well, the criminalization of drugs creates the criminal market. 
If people are engaged in peaceful, nonviolent, consensual transactions with other adults, um, there really is no crime, there's no victim. But the government has criminalized cannabis, which creates risk, which increases the reward, which incentivizes unsavory, dangerous people to get involved. And when the government cracks down on peaceful operators like ourselves, who you can call, you can call me and talk to me any day. Yeah. Um, you when you shut down our businesses, businesses yeah. when you shut down the businesses that are open, um, you're giving a free handout to the gangsters and people who so, are bad. So can, can, I ask, can I ask a question? I'm asking a question because I'm trying to figure out a way to, if there was a way to word this, that because cannabis is now legal and there is a framework and there is a system and the system eventually one day will be no different in a sense than we have regulations and a system for the liquor, liquor, for liquor in BC. That's how I, I have been told the framework will work out. So I am just wondering, in, as you had said, there's many peaceful operators, there's many people who are free of all of those issues that I have concern around. So would you suggest something like, and I'm going to ask you specifically about this because I put a motion forward last term, you may inspire me to bring it back, but uh, self-reporting, like uh, audited financial statements from dispensary. We pay all our taxes, we do everything. No, I mean, like provide to the city of Vancouver audited financial statements to show where the supply is coming from, where the money is coming from. Is that something that you would support? Oh, I'd be happy to. The danger right now is that most of the suppliers, many of whom are licensed actually, federally licensed for medical production or growing for another patient, so they are legal in a sense, just not legal commercial. But a lot of the suppliers uh, can't really out themselves because they are at risk of criminal uh, retaliation and significant serious penalties. So the law is forcing them to hide, whereas if we allowed them to come forward, you could meet them. There are good and bad operators in every business, I'm sure you all know, um, from restaurants and bars and everything. But with the dispensary, right now, again, the threat of closure makes good, decent people afraid and they yeah. back out, and people who aren't afraid um, will step in and fill that Thank gap. Thank you, and I understand that. I just, I'm looking for a system or a framework, and and that's very helpful to know that you support audited financials. And I, I will note that the uh, NMRU, the Medical Marijuana Related Use Bylaws that City Council did pass, acknowledged that these businesses were providing cannabis that is not from a federal uh, pipeline of cannabis. It was illicit, but it works. And every day of delay means more people suffer. And again, please look at these studies because without a doubt, one life saved by access to cannabis um, is worthwhile and Thank worth immediate action. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I know organizations like I Hope will give me so put someone through at the night so that they won't feel opioids that night and they'll be alive the next day. Um, what is the kind of substitute that you normally utilize in a medical way for someone using opioids. Is there a certain... Oh, gummies and edibles have worked really well. Again, uh, Sarah Blake and others, uh, Neil Magnuson, the Cannabis Substitution Project, High Hopes, they find people really just want uh, the edibles. Um, they want just a cookie or a gummy bear because they can take it and be fine. If you're smoking a joint on the street, uh, you might attract law enforcement attention, especially those who are already living on the street and don't have safe housing. Um, so the use of cannabis in, in smoking it can actually bring you more scrutiny and harm. So a lot of users would prefer to have a packet of gummies in their pocket and they eat one and they're okay. But for many users, it's the immediate onset of smoking. Um, if they only have $5 from their welfare check, $5 bill that they've managed to get, they can go to a dispensary, get a joint, smoke half that joint, and feel okay. Um, but when the mayor, respectfully, sir, um, when you say that there is a like, legal way for people to access it, it's through the mail. I'm a medical patient. I'm signed up. I do it. I use my credit card. It costs at least $100. Most people don't have that. Uh, you need it to your home where you give a signature. A lot of people don't have that. And you have to wait days. So the immediate storefront access is actually so key. People can come in and just get a small amount at one time. And we even have uh, programs where people donate their cannabis. If they're visiting the lounges that we have or any other area, they can leave behind their cannabis for others. And it does save lives. Um, so again, while it's true there is a legal system in place, um, it, the fact is it's broken. And Justin Trudeau and businesses across Canada, the Privacy Commissioner of Canada, admit that the current system is flawed and preventing access and won't be fixed for some time. But Vancouver showed great leadership under our former mayor, and I hope our current mayor, who also engaged in peaceful civil disobedience and 
you know, court order breaking, um, might recognize the value of people taking this bold action and the city saying, you know what, despite the federal laws and despite the prohibitions, we have done the right thing before with insight, needle exchanges, and all sorts of other important issues. Why not do the right thing that the science proves from decades of research, peer-reviewed science, that cannabis dispensaries specifically save lives and that when you close dispensaries, you cause more deaths. It's irrefutable, and you have the right and the, and the, the right of goodness, and not just the legal right to do this. Um, another thing that was brought up was spaces for drug users to be together in doing that. And I know that that's involved in some of the cannabis <coughs> culture. Can you explain how you think that could grow for looking at different drugs as well? Oh, it's so key. Um, it's no doubt that people on the downtown east side right now, and as we heard, uh, lack of community and lack of support systems are deadly. Uh, people who are alone and isolated uh, are more likely to die. I can tell you that we just finished Canadian Mental Health uh, Center Association training with our managers uh, because our employees, many of them, like I noted, are people who have substance abuse issues or struggle and they can't get a job elsewhere and we're the only place they can get a job and they literally call us the family. That our lounges bring together people from all over the world who come together and go, I can't believe I get to sit next to someone like me. I get to feel like someone who drinks coffee or someone who does yoga or someone who rides a bicycle. I get to be with people like me. That is so invaluable. It destroys the stigma. It enables conversation. They can talk to each other about what works. They can connect someone with another healthcare provider. These meeting spaces are essential and these consumption spaces are key. Whether it's a tent thrown up at the overdose prevention site or a lounge where consumers choose to come and gather together. But these community spaces are so valuable. The West End Davy Street location has drag nights and music nights and jam nights and we have art on the wall and we do fundraisers and we do charities. Mr. Mayor, we contribute to the city not just through employment and taxes but through an actual life-saving service. And I need to note again that it isn't fair to say that someone has to be at their last breath with a needle in hand before we can say, yes, you deserve cannabis access. It's someone like me or anyone here or your children who are pressured to drink alcohol, who are pressured to pop a Xanax in high school. This is horrifying to me when the evidence shows and BC Center of Substance Use shows that more cannabis access and use by all people benefits public health. It doesn't harm it. Um, and again, Mr. Mayor, I've noticed you paying such close attention to every speaker here with consideration and compassion in your eyes. I can't help but feel a little bit right now that when the media has set us up, you know, Jody says, Mayor says, I'm, I don't like that. I'm not here to be confrontational. And we're at five minutes. Thank you. Go ahead. Go Thank you, Mr. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Ms. Emery. Uh, I just, I just want to pull it back to the, 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 the real specific opioid recommendations because we've sort of gotten into the dispensary conversation this morning. I know that's an issue, uh, but not this issue. Uh, it's connected, but but I'm wondering, do you see, uh, let's take, take aside the, the dispensary issue for a moment. Can we focus, is there a bit, do you have any thoughts about how we might uh, add cannabis substitution into our existing and proposed systems as it stands now, without getting into the dispensary idea, but actually similar to the, the, the work with Sarah Blythe on the, the, the overdose prevention. prevention. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a city councilor yet, but um, I wrote up something in this report that I hope sounds a little bit like nice legal municipal language, but quite frankly, you can just insert right into the recommendations that we recommend holding back on enforcement on these facilities that are offering harm reduction and safer choice on But I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, and I did read that in the recommendation. I'm trying to pull it away from the dispensary, the physical dispensary issue, because that is a, a whole other complicated issue. We're in a, in a, in a pretty big crisis right. mitigation process right now for, the, you know, without getting into that whole, that's opening a whole other flank. So I'm more looking at how we might bring medical cannabis into like insight kind of environments, and do we have that? Do you have thoughts on that kind of a thing? Existing, not cannabis related infrastructure. In fact, um, a few years ago, Stop the Violence BC, which was started by former um, or Dr. Evan Wood of the BC Center of Excellence in HIV and AIDS, and others, we he proposed, why don't we open up a cannabis medical storefront with a Section 56 exemption, like like Insight did, 
where we, I understand that the exemption means we won't criminalize people who show up at this site, and Insight doesn't provide the drugs that are being used, but for cannabis um, use and access, and I mean, I'm, I'm so sorry, but I, I can't get away from the fact that we can't separate dispensaries and the opioid crisis. Like, specifically, this is about, the dispensaries are about the opioid crisis. That's what these studies cite. They aren't even saying medical marijuana generally. In fact, the, the studies say that even places that legalize marijuana or medical marijuana that don't allow dispensaries do not have any protective results. Only those that allow dispensaries um, and, in fact, a liberal allowance, a non-restrictive allowance, um, see opioid crisis alleviation. Uh, direct result, opioid deaths, use, overdoses go down with dispensaries. It is, you cannot pull them apart. Um, so the medical cannabis issue, I think right now what the city needs to do is to address the fact that federal law and provincial regulations prohibit medical access points. Um, the retail that we're being asked to apply for, Mr. Mayor, um, is for recreational sales. There is no opportunity for medical storefronts to offer these um, services. And there were dispensaries that were providing free opioid substitution. So you sell to somebody who comes in and spends money to do cannabis instead of alcohol, and then someone who comes in with an addiction can get cannabis for free because that customer paid the company. So I, I, I again, Mr. Mayor, it seems you kept paying so much attention to every other speaker, but it looks like you can't wait for me to stop talking. And that breaks my heart because I'm a Green Party candidate of the past. I'm an advocate for our community and our society, and it just seems to me that you're treating this like a joke, and that really, really breaks my heart. Because Canada saved my life, and it saved other people's lives, and for you to dismiss this, when the city of Vancouver has a history from Sam Sullivan and Larry Campbell and so many others, they took courageous stands, and I implore you to do the same and not give in to political cowardice, which is so easy to do, but sir, there's so many years for you to make this right. I just, just you know, the conversation has one is welcome to have their own opinions, but name calling of anyone in the chambers, I just like to caution everyone. I, I would ask you to caution. Thank you very much. May I ask what the name calling was? I'm, I, I, I said political cowardice, but that applies to Trudeau and also to governments. I'm not saying who's a mayor, but. I, I, I have no more questions. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Thank Byron. you very much for your time here today. Substitution Project. I have an informative pack that I'd like to have hands around. Mm -hmm. Really, only two things should be needed to be said here. Cannabis is safe, one of the safest therapeutically active compounds known to man, according to DEA Judge Francis Young. And it's effective in offsetting the use of opioids and other things, as has been pointed out by Jeremiah and by Jody. And I thank Jeremiah and Jody for bringing to this discussion cannabis as a substitution because really it's the invisible elephant in the room and in your report. Uh, it was two years ago, a little more than that, that I came before council, a different council with a couple of notable exceptions, and proposed what we were going to do. I had unanimous consent from the board of Van Du to start handing out cannabis edibles on the downtown east side for free to people try to make it as easy as possible for people to get off of the street drugs. There wasn't one question for me after I presented that to council. I, I had a lawyer lobby council and lawyer for a couple of months after that with no response, no support. So during that time, I'd also gotten donations and support from the cannabis community. So after a couple of months, I just went to Van Duyn and started hanging them out. Well, the CSP is now almost two years in existence. It'll be died in February. For the first year, every Saturday, and every single Saturday, we met at Van Duyn. and for the last 10 months, we've been there every Thursday and every Sunday. I took the lunch break to go and hand out care packs of cannabis edibles to people uh, on the downtown east side, which I say we've been doing twice a week since last February. We have a lineup of somewhere in the neighborhood of 160, 170 people every time that get their care packs. 
there's four to six edibles, there's topical creams, there's caps, there's a couple of joints. Um, with respect to edibles, I will say that edibles do work better than joints for substituting off of opioids. Um, the joints work because they work right away and 45 minutes later the edibles will kick in. And that's what really works. They're, they're, they're processed through the liver, not through the lungs. They last much longer, like hours longer, and they're much stronger that way. And I learned back in 2004 when I opened Vancouver's second dispensary called the Herb School that good strong cannabis edibles can help <coughs> opioid addicts get right through the night of withdrawal without needing anything else. And cannabis is an exit drug, absolutely, for people wanting to get off of that. And as Jody referenced, there's a number of people working in her stores and dispensaries, and a number of people working in dispensaries all over the city that'll tell you that cannabis saved their life, and that they used to be hard drug addicts, and now they're just using cannabis. We have about 100 regulars in our lineup that have been there almost from the start, many of them well over a year for sure, and we've never had one reported overdose death amongst our regulars that are using cannabis as a substitute, and these are hard drug users and ex-hard drug users. All of it is by donations and volunteers. We have no help from government. In fact, no one from the city, police, or coastal health has even ever come to check us out and see what we're doing, even though we're giving out hundreds and hundreds of this criminally illegal product every single time. And I, I told the police board, I went before the police board and told them what we were doing. I told you people what we were doing. I've given out thousands and thousands of these. I've been to numerous events all over the place. And we're not trying to hide, we're not trying to conceal anything. What we're doing is criminal according to the government law but it's certainly not criminal according to reason. I think the government law has no force and effect when it's not causing someone to prevent harm, but it's actually causing harm itself. And these laws need to be violated by the city council, and you need to allow, in fact, you should be declaring Vancouver a sanctuary for medical cannabis. There's no provision within the federal structure for cannabis legalization to allow for medical cannabis stores. And that's, according to the Allard decision, Judge Phelan said it was at the heart of access and crucial to have medical cannabis access. And there's no provision within the federal regulations. So thankfully now Vancouver can do that yourself. And please do, please help us save lives through cannabis. I know you didn't want to hear about dispensaries anymore, but I'm telling you dispensaries are the key to this access to cannabis, which will offset the opioid crisis. It's not the only solution. There needs to be others as well, but it's a huge one. We also need access in consumption lounges, as Julian was mentioning. They should be mandatory with medical dispensaries. It's a sense of community for people. It's a place where people can feel free to go and safe to go. The federal government continues to be in violation of Judge Phelan's declaration that medical dispensaries are crucial and at the heart of access. Because, as I said, they have no provision for this. It's major hypocrisy. Commercial tobacco is in all gas stations and grocery stores across this country. It doesn't matter how close they are to schools. We have recreational alcohol dispensaries all over the city. There's thousands of them. They're all clustered together. They're side by side. They don't have the same restrictions as medical cannabis dispensaries. It's complete hypocrisy, and it's killing people. And that's why it needs to stop. We need to have treatment on demand. And this is treatment on demand. We need to have safe access to safe drugs. These are safe drugs. We need to have choices for people. This is the choice they need to make. We also need to, you should probably add into your report, not just that the dispensaries are providing access and should be a crucial part of your task force's recommendations is to keep them open, but also to, to educate the public about this. Because it's not just the downtown east side where people are dying of overdoses, it's all across the city. And many people, if they really understood that cannabis edibles could help them get through the night and not crave those other drugs that are potentially deadly, then they would choose that if they knew that was an option. So you need to really publicize that as well. The role of government is not to stifle business and commerce. The role of government is to encourage commerce and to facilitate it. Regulations come into play whenever there's problems to do with things that are being sold and how they're being used. But regulations, and I see my time is running out, I hope you'll be a little generous with me because my five minutes are very, very, very essential, essential here. But regulations need to be to the point where an underground market does not become viable. And prohibition just flat out doesn't work. And there's a whole bunch of solutions to this, pro this problem that we have, but there's only one real cause, and that's prohibition and over restriction. Thank you very much. Here's your five minutes, Thank you. We have a question from Councilor Perkins. Thank you, Mr. Um I want to focus because, again, I think it was 369 people died last year. Um, 
And what we've heard from the various speakers over the course of the day so far is the number one issue has been safe supply of, of the, the drugs that are causing the crisis. And our objective, of course, we don't, we're not going to you know, solve all of society's ills, but we're trying to get into a balanced situation, get ourselves out of this crisis. So safe supply was number one. We've heard that physical locations are important, uh, not just in the downtown east side, but through the body of the city in order to provide uh, other people other places to go because we know, apart from the downtown east side, that people are dying at home because they're, they're not out where anybody else can see them. We've heard that education plays an important role in, in this, and including starting with, with kids in, as young as middle school so that uh, they won't start experimenting with, with bad drugs. And what I've heard from you is uh, a dimension of harm, preve uh, harm prevention through providing alternatives. <coughs> Would you characterize it that way? Yeah, I, I think safe supply doesn't necessarily just need to be the drugs of choice, but safe supply should be whatever drug is going to get them what they're actually seeking. But that may be the case, but what we're here about is the opioid crisis and, and saving lives. And I haven't heard of anybody that has died of an overdose of marijuana. And that hasn't happened. Right. So, um, bringing us back to the core purpose, I'm just concerned that the, that the issue of what's gone on with, with the medical marijuana dispensaries is being conflated with this life and death issue of the opioid crisis. So, uh, what the best takeaway that I've got from, from, uh, from this is that, that as we look at things like physical locations, and we look at education that uh, maybe part of that could be looking at harm prevention through alternatives if people are going to use drugs, then better be marijuana, which is going to have beneficial effects, then is going to end them dead in their apartments. Absolutely. So that would be a good takeaway. Not that we're going to conflate that with, with what's going on in, in your industry, but rather dealing specifically with this opioid crisis. And i got to bring it back to Canada's dispensaries. They are safe spaces for people. They provide education for people. Uh, I know I'm very in touch with most of the dispensaries in Vancouver. I've been an advocate for a very long time. As I said, I was involved in opening Vancouver's second dispensary back in 2004. And every single dispensary that's out there has clientele that are using cannabis in replacement of opioids and tell those people that they're saving their lives. They all have compassionate pricing situations for people that can't afford it. Um, I want to mention the 420 Farmers Market as well that was operating in Robson until the city and the police shut them down. Now they're in another park regularly on the weekends. Those people are there providing access to cannabis edibles to the people on, on opioids. They have been all along. And they provide a lot of free edibles to people. They're in a park right now that's close to the downtown east side. And when they go there, they clean the park with needles before they start. And they're being threatened by the city to be shut down as well. And I think that this city really needs to pay attention to its history and the other mayors that have come before, although I will say it's the activists that have pretty much dragged the councils a little bit kicking and screaming into progressive drug policy over the years. But you look like very good people to me. And I think that if you really think about, you know, that laws aren't in effect if they're, if they're hurting people. And they really only should be in effect if they're keeping people from being harmed. And to be worried about federal laws when people's lives are at risk, and you know, we can't have medical dispensaries because the federal government isn't allowing for that. People are dying. The laws be damned in that case. And I hope that you have that same idea, like Sarah had and like I've had, that you know, even though you guys wouldn't give me approval to do what I said we needed to do because it was a federal matter and it was illegal, we went ahead and did it. Now we've been doing it for almost two years. We haven't had one overdose death amongst the people that are using our project. So I hope that you will listen to what's being said today as well and be bold and stand in the face of laws that don't make any sense, that are archaic, that are there to protect other than the people, because that's always what drug prohibition is all about, is protecting other than the people. If I could, for just a couple minutes here, I, I, I wrote a letter. Your questioning comes around. Okay, well, I, I just want to finish up. And I, 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 again, I appreciate that cannabis may, may well have a positive impact in providing alternatives for opioids. <coughs> But I don't want to conflate um, a, a commercial and legal exercise that's going through, on with, with the dispensaries with the core issue of, of the opioid crisis. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Just don't do anything. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks, Mr. Matheson. I appreciate you coming in. And uh, my question is really very specific. I mean, I've been providing um, uh, edibles and products uh, in the downtown side. So your cannabis substitution project, um, I think, has 
has been um, very much uh, uh, supported, and um, and I think people are very grateful uh, for it. We still have 160 people or so um, line up uh, to get those substitutions. Even in the rain. Pardon me. Even in the rain, we must Even be doing some good. Okay. Sure. So where is your supply? Do you get it from the um, cannabis right. stores? So here's a typical care pack. Um, I have these, which are ordered online, and there's a, a very compassionate person who's generous and has told me that I can order $10,000 worth of these gummies every month, and that's what I do. They arrive at my post office box, and I divide them up and we give them up. So that's those ones. This is from a, a dispensary in Gibson's. It's licensed by their municipality to operate, uh, s and Sweet Shop. And they give me hundreds and hundreds of these because he's an ex-opioid addict who wants to give back to, to what our project is doing, helping people transition off of those street drugs. This is a cookie that we've had for almost the full time that we've been there. It's made by now an ex-school teacher. He was a high school teacher that quit his job to go full time in doing this. He, he supplies Sarah with these cookies. He supplies us. And we found another injection site as well. And they're not safe, by the way, Adrian. They're supervised because they're not safe. They're not safe injection sites. They're safer. But there's no way to safely inject drugs. A doctor doesn't inject it safely. There's no safe way to stick a needle in your arm and inject something. That's why they're supervised, and that's why we don't call them safe and we do call them supervised. But he's supplying those people, and this is extremely wholesome. There's no nuts, and he wants to give people healthy food, and he also just wants to give back because his previous experience with opioids. This is from a gummy manufacturer who wants to be legal, and they package them as close as they can to being legal. But He's lost most of his dispensaries that he sells into because of the ban on edibles, and most of these dispensaries want to become non-medical government stores. So his business is way down. He used to just supply these, almost the same amount of value as what we're getting these, without any charge, but because his business went way down, he had to go back to work, and we have to supply him with cannabis in his raw form for him to make these gummies for us. But they're standardized dose, they're all uh, on there, and they're trying to be legal. Uh, the person that allows me to order $10,000 worth of gummies every month also supplies this 175 milligram THC topical cream for people with skin cancer, for people with pain in their joints. And my, my people at Bandu are just raving about how well that's working. They can't get enough of that. We also have caps provided by people. They're 30 milligrams, which is about the right dose for people. We've had them as high as 100 milligrams, but that could be too much for some people for sure. Um, way too much for some people, but we're dealing with people that need high dose to use against the opioids. And there's a joint in our bag, as I mentioned before. If I ever don't put a joint in the bag, right away I get called out. The person at my desk that's getting it says, is there a joint in there? And I wasn't even going to give out joints originally when I first presented it to City Council back two years ago. I only wanted to give out edibles because I knew that edibles were, were effective because of my experience at the Herb School. But I did give out joints because I'm also in charge of having joints rolled up for 420 and Cannabis Day, and we had a little bit of a surplus. So when I started giving out the edibles, I also gave out some joints. And then when I tried to stop giving out joints, they were like, no, no, we really need the joints. And I came to understand it's because the edibles take a little while to kick in that they want to have a joint to get them through that time. But cannabis certainly works. I get so many thank yous and so many uh, you know, anecdotal stories about how it's working every time that I'm at Van Dunes. That's twice a week that people are telling me how well it's working for them and keeping them off the hard drugs. Back to the, um, the issue of uh, replacement, that this is replacement. That's the idea. Um, how many, so I was uh, told by an earlier speaker um, that there may be thousands of people um, who use um, the cannabis products as replacement for, uh, for the opioids, um, and they go into the various cannabis stores. So, um, but you have 160. We have about 160 every time that we're there. Uh, it's a long lineup, and what we have there you know, is enough to satisfy that, but not too much more. And it hasn't grown much more than that, surprisingly enough. But uh, I would concur with what Jeremiah said, that there's probably thousands throughout the city, because at this point there's still medical cannabis dispensaries that they can access to. What we're dealing with is a population that deals with poverty as, a, as one of their main barriers. And they're willing to stand in the rain and stand in the cold and get some free stuff, because they can't afford it. These things are expensive because of prohibition prices. The cannabis grows quite easily. It shouldn't be anywhere near as expensive as what it is, but because of prohibition and now the market demand for things, uh, it's a lot higher priced than what it should be. But there's a lot of people using cannabis dispensaries in the city. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's it for questions, so thanks for your time. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Bailey. Well, thanks to uh, 
speak on here uh, that have to uh, address a couple of things uh, that I'll have do wrap back around with and connection with the opiate crisis that is what is table today. This is my daughter, Haley. Haley is a medical cannabis patient. Now, please bear with me and I will explain my point. I, well, unfortunately, uh, I found out this yesterday, so I did not have time to photocopy these, but these are relevant and will show you multiple reasons why we need to look at things like the Substitution Act, which all of, all of you are well aware of and are open to. Here are three years worth of documentation from my daughter's doctor stating that without medical cannabis, she is at risk of life-threatening status epilepticus. My daughter has been fighting lennox Gastaut syndrome since she was five years old. We are talking 19 years. She's 26 years old now. Uh, Yes, you're almost said <laughs> In April. Haley was Canada's first federal child patient back in 2008. There's a signature strain called Haley's Comet named after my daughter. There's a well-known documented strain. And many people who suffer opiate crisis also utilize one-to-one -one strains, such as my daughter's strain. These are sort of, these are strains that are only able to be accessed in edible form, in concentrations, through places like dispensaries. Now, I understand that there was something, but please, listen, I also have, just for confirmation and validation of what I have to say today, I also have Vancouver Coastal Health protocols for inhaled and oral cannabis in the public school system to be administered by staff. So therefore, when you come into issues of administering how will substitution programs work, please, the groundwork has already been laid and please utilize these things to help you succeed in your ventures. Currently, the laws surrounding medical cannabis allow for some access, and yes, there are legal routes. But as uh, many of my colleagues have stated, it is very difficult to access. In my daughter's particular case, we are legally allowed to grow. We are in turn. She received her license for growing once again, although we had fallen out of many times jurisdictions. Thankfully, the cannabis clubs my daughter is here today. They are literally saving her life today because they are providing cannabis for her in the interim while her crop is legally growing. Um, why this is important is because the federal government's uh, program, which those who are fighting and, and trying to survive through this opiate crisis, cannot afford access to these also, they are not in proper concentration. An example would be my daughter requires 135 milligrams CBD and 112 milligrams THC per dose orally, three times a day, plus inhaled as a PRN. Now that means that in order for her to have those kind of doses, there is only one place she can go, and that is to a medical dispensary. Many patients, including myself, I will tell you a little bit about myself now, 28 years ago, I was a heroin addict on the streets of Vancouver, down on Hastings. 28 years ago, through cannabis, I got clean. And now I advocate, and I educate, and I teach others in harm reduction and education, as well as for medical aspects like seizures that my daughter fights. Um, if there is not easy accessibility for patients, such as my daughter or other patients fighting the opiate crisis, for options for harm reduction, such as cannabis as a medicine, you will find there will be more problems. If my daughter can't access it, where am I left to go? I cannot afford to, and she cannot afford, she's on disability, she cannot afford those, that type of money for what she must require. It's not an option. And 
when it comes to uh, other patients' needs, somebody who's fighting opiates and that, I have witnessed an alcoholic, I spent three days with him, giving him inhaled to help with nausea, to help with that initial wake up when they're feeling very, very violently ill. I am an ex heroin addict. I know what that feels like. It is not something anyone should have to go through. And cannabis does eat it. Or ease it, sorry. <laughs> um, when I helped this gentleman through three days of serious withdrawals, his fear was seizures. There were no seizures. He managed to, after three days, stop alcohol for a matter of months. Unfortunately, because of the fact that there are such gaps in these crises, he ended up going back to alcohol, which although is not an opiate, it does lead that bridge into that. Because if you can't access alcohol, but you can access a pill that's going to give you that difference, you're going to go after it. We need to ensure that these people don't have that. Um, Thank you very much for, for your time today. Uh, we've got a little bit over. Uh, again, I'm very sorry, very sorry for, for making you wait and very much appreciate your uh, testimony here today. Uh, we, we have nobody on, on the questions queue, so uh, but we do, uh, the clerk is going to email around what you distributed to all the councillors to make sure that we have that. Please. Again, thank you very much for, for coming in today. Can she, can she just say one thing that she wanted to say? Sure. Please not shut down the clubs where I have access to medication I need. Thank you. Thank you.